Okay, the shorthand approach, I would say, is to ask if the, if the claim that you're presented with uh, is reproducible, ask if, it is, if there's some way of testing it in which you can prove that it's false, so can it be refuted? Um, it's no good asking if something can, if you can provide evidence that supports something, because there might be an infinite number of ideas that are supported by a given piece of evidence, whereas if you look for something that can't possibly happen if this idea is true, and it happens, then it proves that the, that the idea is wrong. Um, so look for, look for the possibility of falsification. Um, like I said, repeatability, so ask if ask if this is something that's come out of just one study or just one source claiming it or if it comes from several different sources. Um, ask if the source is reputable, um, if it's someone who actually knows about the area that they're discussing or if it's just someone who's done a whole bunch of research on the internet. Um, ask, if the, ask if the claim is can be can be simplified down to something that has the same explanatory value, um, but which has fewer extraneous ideas associated with it. Um, for for example, um, the idea that the dinosaurs died out as a result of an asteroid hitting the Earth. Um, that's a that's a pretty good scientific hypothesis, and it's supported by the evidence. Uh, the idea that the dinosaurs died as a result of aliens redirecting an asteroid so that it hit the Earth um, and caused a global environmental catastrophe is consistent with all of the evidence for an asteroid impact, but it's got this extra detail in it of aliens doing something which is just unnecessary. It doesn't actually add anything to the theory. So you can sl sort of slice that extra bit of complication away and come up with a better explanation. Um, and ask if there's a mechanism. I think the bottom line is scientific theories deal with mechanisms. Um, they don't deal with the kind of this thing happened and then this other thing happened and they kind of look similar so there's a cause effect thing going on. Explanation. That's more sympathetic magic. Um, ask if there's a mechanism whereby one thing causes something that causes something else that causes something else that leads to an end result. You know. Um, drugs, drugs that treat diseases work because they affect the immune system in a certain way or they interfere with the biological functioning of pathogens or whatever. Um, gravity works because masses create distortions in space-time which affect the paths of other things moving through the nearby space-time so that their, their paths get deflected all these these sorts of things the, the presence of a mechanism is probably the defining feature of a scientific theory in many ways that it's that it's actually something about causes and effects rather than just vague airy fairy ideas of these things are similar so there's probably something going on there a useful explanation i would say is one that gives you more information that, that allows you to predict how things are going to go in the future um, if somebody says um, that something happened that was unexpected. Right? Maybe uh, you're expecting the expecting the annual flood to to come and and provide fertile soil to grow crops in, and the flood doesn't come one year. And the explanation is God moves in mysterious ways. You don't really get any explanatory value out of that it's an excuse rather than an explanation um, because you can't predict whether God is going to be moving in mysterious ways next year but if you have a theory of the weather um, which incorporates something like long-term meteorological cycles or things like the El Nino or whatever that might affect the weather and explain that this failure of the flood is part of a long-term trend that could be that could be analysed and predicted so you can tell the next time it's going to happen, then it's, then it's actually got some explanatory value. It's more than just uh, a way of excusing a lack of knowledge. So, yeah, I think I agree basically with Popper that falsifiability is central to science. 
Um, but the caveat on that, of course, is that you can't always absolutely falsify something. You can exclude something to within a certain range of probability. Um, for instance, is light a wave or a particle? Right? If you looked just at um, a shadow, right, the shadow of my hand on the ground, it it doesn't seem to produce any wave-like effects. You know, sound waves will wrap around the corner of a building, whereas light waves won't. Um, so you can exclude the idea that light is a wave, but in fact, you can't completely exclude the idea that it's a wave because you can only measure those those wave-like effects down to a certain sensitivity given by our, our sensors and our measuring instruments. And when you look at a finer sensitivity, then you do find those wave-like effects of light. So the first attempt to falsify the wave theory of light seems to be a success, but in fact you haven't 100% falsified. Um, so, so I think Popper was on the right track, um, and there are certainly some things that you can, you can falsify really, really strongly um, but there, are, there has to be a more subtle approach there where you recognise that there are, there's wiggle room in terms of what our experiments can and can't detect so far. Um, there's certainly a sociological aspect to science where um, people think something is the case and because they're just human, you know, they're not perfectly rational, they might have their own little internal biases, their own little perspectives on things. Um, so they might cling to ideas a little bit more strongly than they should and everybody's prone to that I'm prone to that everyone's prone to it so you just have to try try your best essentially to to be as as fair minded towards competing theories as you can and look at the evidence first and foremost um, so there's certainly an effect whereby yes when when the senior people retire or die off or whatever there's you know an opening in the ecosystem for new ideas to move in um, but at the, at the end of the day, um, I don't think science is purely a social construct. In that, I don't think it's, I don't think it's purely just what people decide by consensus. I think that it is actually about looking at empirical evidence. Um, and that where that where that I suppose falls down on, on the the demarcation issue um, is, uh, oh, it's it's kind of subtle question because there are there are theories within science especially in, in high energy physics that like I said before are f have been far removed from experimental testing for some time and so people can try very hard to come up with theories and make sure that they're mathematically consistent and consistent with what we think are good principles to, to understand how physical reality works but at the end of the day they hopefully smack up against an experimental test and that's the test that just determines what's true or false so before the test comes along people can people can quite rightly or well, you know, quite quite validly claim that such and such an idea is a load of baloney um, that it's it's just pure mathematical speculation without any connection to the real world and I think that yeah, the, there's some ground for saying that string theory and loop quantum gravity and a bunch of other theories are, are open to some amount of that criticism. Um, you know, and there are, there are other examples. Like I was, uh, one, one I was thinking of recently is um, there's an idea... Yeah, there, there, is, there is an idea which is not widely held within the medical community that the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, does not cause AIDS. And there are people who have scientific credentials who push this idea, but it's generally viewed as being a crackpot view that's at, at odds with the evidence. Um, and I don't necessarily, I don't think that they're correct. I, I, I'm in the camp where I go with the, the medical consensus that says that HIV does cause AIDS. Um, but there's another idea which says that cancer rather than being simply a malfunction of the way cells behave, is a reversion of cells from a multicellular state back to a sort of single-celled organism mode, that the, the, the genetic code for being a single-celled organism is embedded right there in, in our cells 
from back before the evolution of multicellularity and cancer arises when something happens that epigenetically triggers cells to revert back to this more primitive state of behavior. Um, and hence you could try to treat cancer by exposing cancers to an environment that is dissimilar to the Earth's environment during the period when multicellular life was, pro was prominent. Now that could be a complete crackpot theory, or it could be quite plausible. And it seems to me that there's a really, you know, you know people's lives could depend upon whether that's a crackpot theory or a reasonable theory. Um, and so finding some solution to the demarcation question of, of deciding, well, is this, actually a, is this actually a theory that's worthy of serious scientific, scientific investigation or should we chuck it out? This is actually a really practical, important problem that it's literally a matter of life and death for some people because if there's a potential cancer, useful cancer treatment lurking in there and we don't investigate it, people could die. Um, if, it's, if it's a waste of time and it det detracts money away from more fruitful cancer treatments, people could die. So I don't necessarily know that I have a really good solution to the demarcation problem in that regard, but I do think that a solution to the demarcation problem is important. Um, very important.